All right, we've got a fantastic guest today. Uh, his name is Steve Lindsley. Let me give you a little background on him, and then I'll, I'll be brief, and then you can, and then you can listen to him. Um, so Steve went to BYU. Uh, he studied management and he played football. He was um, he was the quarterback for BYU, which wow, that's a, that means that means something. Um, so he, uh, after going to BYU, he uh, transitioned to KSL, um, and he worked for KSL News Radio and KSL TV, um, and he worked his way up through the ranks and eventually became the president of KSL. Um, I'm going to hit a couple other highlights in his career, which are, are uh, just outstanding. Um, he's been the chairman and CEO of uh, USDTV, US Digital Television. Um, at Comcast, he served, he served as a regional vice president. Um, he's a division vice president um, of Spectrum Reach and Charter in Los Angeles. Uh, this is somebody who uh, I think starting in college, maybe before then, has been <coughs> um, leading people. And this is, what, this is the background of somebody who understands leadership. I'm very pleased to welcome, um, I think for the first time at SUU, no, I've been here before, but never at this beautiful building, for sure. <laughs> Please welcome Steve Winston. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, good morning, everybody. How's it going? Um, so on this competition here, the, uh, is it okay? Can, we, can you take donations to up the ante yes. on the prize money? Yeah. So I'll double the first one there. So the first place is now four grand. So we'll, I'll put in a couple of grand. Um, so, and then I probably ought to get, because my kids don't believe me when I do this, but can you say hi to my kids for the selfie real quick? Okay, good. Now, then they, yeah, dad, you went down to Southern Utah today and had a conversation with 200 kids. Yeah, no, I did. And there's a, there's a conversation right there. So um, I'll take a few minutes and kind of go through my past. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time necessarily talking about me, even though it's kind of my experience. So I guess that's what I have to talk about. Some will go to lunch after, possibly. Whoever wants, do you just invite a group, or how do you do it's that? the fastest, the strongest, and the smartest. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I'll, let me try to buzz through a lot of this in the half hour, and then we'll do some Q&A. I did play quarterback 100 years ago for BYU. These are my stats. The thing that really ticks me off is the BYU information people got my interceptions and my touchdowns wrong. I think my touchdowns were 18 and my interceptions were 12. The, uh, I had fun at BYU. The challenge is I followed five All-Americans. So Steve Young, you guys don't remember a lot of them, but Jim McMahon and Steve Young and Robbie, Robbie Bosco, the guy that played ahead of me, won the national championship. So my year, we went eight and four, and they're like, eh, it was a so-so year. About two years ago, I have this, I have my youngest son, Jake, who's 16 now, so he's been 13 or 14, we were watching one of my games, it was like the seventh or eighth game of the year. And um, on the graphic, it popped up, it said, Steve Lindsley currently ranked fourth in the country in total offense. And my son looked at me and he goes, you were ranked fourth in the country? You know, he couldn't believe it. And I said, Jake, you have no idea how much abuse I took by being ranked fourth. Because back then, BYU was ranked first every year, like for a decade or whatnot. The Thunderbirds, did we kill it this year? I was looking at the record. Not, not quite a... Uh... Anyway, I'm sure they gave it a good effort. It, what was the record? I was trying to look it up on the freeway and I couldn't really see what the number was, but maybe we don't go there. Anyway, uh, so just a couple of things real quick. I'm gonna give you some thoughts on disruption and disruptive technologies will kind of be the overarching theme in the time that we have. But I want to share some experiences with you, and then I want to share what I learned. So hopefully you can learn it faster than I did, and you can apply it in, in whatever you're doing. 
I, when I left uh, BYU, I, I went to work at KSL TV just in their media, bless you, just in the, the media teams, and I was knocking on doors. I had the best list of the whole group. I had the yellow pages. It was about that thick. And I just whipped through, and I called as many people as I could, and I hit, I hit the streets as fast as I could. In nine years, I was the general manager of the company, and I ended up being the president of the combined companies overseeing uh, uh, television especially. Um, and it was a super cool experience. Uh, Salt Lake won the Winter Olympics during that time. We were an NBC affiliate, so I got to work with NBC Sports a lot. One experience taught me a tremendous lesson, and that is it doesn't matter where you are, you have more influence usually than you think you do. We usually under gauge how much influence we can have. So back in the mid-90s, how many of you have seen the movie or have heard the movie Schindler's List? Okay, so quite a few. I highly, highly recommend that you see it. It's like a Saving Private Ryan type of an experience. It's just a, re a gut check, a reality check on what was really going on in the war during that time. Well, the president of NBC cut a deal with Steven Spielberg at Amblin Entertainment. And that deal was, uh, yes, you can run Schindler's List on the broadcast network, but you can't cut any of the material. In other words, you can't edit it for TV. So I was at the conference in Los Angeles when I heard about it, and my first thought was, that's great because it's a phenomenal movie, and my second thought was, uh-oh, I'm dead because KSL TV is owned by the LDS Church in Salt Lake City, and I knew that there, were some, there was some language in there, and there was some, I would say, non-contextual nudity, had nothing to do with the prison camp. It was more sexual in nature, and so I thought, uh-oh, I'm dead. If I run that movie, um, I'm toast, right? So I thought, geez, what can I do? And I'd heard, I read the press reports and everything. It's uncut. You can't touch it. You have to run it exactly the way it comes down. Some would argue that for that type of a message that the, 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 the language and whatnot might have been appropriate, and that could be the discussion. The reality is, is the TV stations were held to a higher standard. You can't have certain language and you can't have certain, um, you know, explicit material. So I thought, well, what the heck, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm president of a good NBC affiliate in Salt Lake. If I don't run this show, it could be a problem for NBC. Other, other sort of more conservative stations may decide they're not going to run it either. So I made an appointment with Don Olmeyer, who's a, who was the president of Los Angeles, uh, uh, Los Angeles of NBC. Really intimidating guy. It's kind of a funny experience. You walk in the door of his office, and there's this big sort of a fire pit looking area where I thought he would come down and want to talk to me. You walk down into the pit and sit on the couch. The other side of the stairs, you walk up, then you walk up another set and his, uh, and his desk is about 10 feet in the air. So his, his desk is about maybe as tall as the top of my head, so not 10 feet or whatnot. So I walk in, sit down, I don't know where he is. All of a sudden, like Moses, he says, Steve, how are you doing? He's sitting up at his desk up here. So I'm down in the pit, you know, there's about eight feet. I'm like, Don, how are you? How are things going? I'm just a, you know, Salt Lake City present general manager of a TV station. I have a major problem. You need to talk to Steven Spielberg and make some cuts on Schindler's List, his prized possession. And Don said, are you crazy? He said, this thing costs us a fortune. We can't do anything with it. He said, all right, shut the door. So I went back up the stairs. I shut the door. And he says, OK, I know it's a problem for you guys in Salt Lake City. He says, get the movie, rent the movie, watch it, and make like five recommendations or six recommendations. And that's it. And send it back. He says, no promises, but I'll give it a shot. So we rented the movie. We took out the F-bombs and some non-contextual nudity. We kept the nudity in that was about the prison camps and the horrific things that went in in those camps, but we cut out the stuff that we didn't think needed to be there. Um, we sent the edit back to Olmeyer, and he quietly got a hold of Steven Spielberg at Amblin Entertainment. They made the cuts for us. 
But guess what? They made them for the whole country. So I thought I was just doing the right thing for Salt Lake City, which I still believe is absolutely the right thing. Some of that stuff didn't belong in the movie. My point is, don't cut yourself short. That's the first lesson. You can make a difference. If you feel strongly about something, and you can make an impassioned plea, and you're tenacious enough with it, you can get stuff done faster than you think. USDTV is essentially the forerunner to Hulu TV. I'll spend more time on that here in a minute, but I was the chairman and founder of the first, what we call the skinny bundle. So, as you know, cable companies have made a living on forcing people to watch 200 channels and to pay for 200 channels until just recently. It's been literally five to seven years where because people have been banging away to say people don't want to pay for 200 channels, they don't want 200 channels, and in fact, they're going around the cable operators and they're going to get their content other ways, right? How many of you in here, just show of hands, how many of you actually pay for a cable package? Nice and high, let me just see how many in here. Right now, did we have one? We have two-ish, three? Okay, demographics are a tad older on that. So that's something that we were able to do and, and bust through. <clears throat> Ultimately, the USD TV was sold to broadcasters. Again, I'll spend a little more time on that. Broadcasters decided they didn't want to compete with cable. So I left that group and I went to the dark side and went to cable, NBC Universal, and ran their media teams in the mountain region. I was hired to run the, uh, from Comcast, I, I, wor I, I commuted every week down to Los Angeles and I ran the Dodgers media networks and the Los Angeles Lakers uh, group plus a 10 Western state uh, group. I left just in time for someone to text me to say, hey, are you sad you left LA now that LeBron went to the Lakers? And I said, ah, yeah, I'll I guess I'll just have to watch him on TV. And, and now I'm the president of Grove Eve, which is a complete departure in some respects because it's a, and I think one of the founders of Grove Eve was here earlier in this series, right, a few weeks ago. Um, what I was asked to do is take Grove Eve to the market. And so I'll spend time. It's really about disruptive technology. That's, that's really the name of the game. What you guys are living through is an amazing time where large institutions are being disrupted as we speak, and they're being disrupted at light speed. You have the ability to work for large institutions and to try to preserve their growth and their strategies, and there's some benefit to that, and you have the ability to be on the other side of the equation and disrupt the large institutions and try to beat them at their game. We'll spend more time specifically on on what I mean uh, here as we go through some examples. So this was my company here. What this, what this announcement is, is a raise of $26 million that we picked up from strategic investors to assemble the broadcasters together to have them compete for the skinny bundle business. To have them compete with what we knew was coming and that was internet delivered content in a package. So think Hulu, think YouTube TV, for example. So we went to the broadcasters, these are the KSL TVs and the local broadcasters, and we said, you have this amazing digital um, uh, capacity, but right now you're just dependent on free over the air TV advertising for your revenue stream. We said, you've got to get in the game. Who else is in the game? Cable, obviously, aggressively in the game. Satellite, obviously, aggressively in the game. Telephone companies with the broadband speeds and the broadband technologies utilizing those delivery systems to get in the game. Broadcasters, what are you doing? You're doing nothing. So we went and uh, we spent several years pulling this thing together. I met with arguably the top media mogul in the world, Rupert Murdoch in New York City. So another example of just a kid from Salt Lake City who had a really good idea and I got to the very, very top. So I had calls with Mark Cuban. I had meetings with Rupert Murdoch. I had meetings with Bob Iger at the time, who or still is the, uh, the chairman CEO of Disney. 
So we got to the top of the top. So don't think that in a short period of time, if you've got something that's potentially disruptive, you'll get to the top quickly. Why is that? Because all of these guys and gals at the top know that they're just a company or two away of getting beat. It's a frightening thought, but it doesn't matter how big you are. The technology is advancing at light speed. You guys all know that. If you can get into something that can make a difference, the top of the top wants to know about it. Okay? So that's a theme that I want you guys to really focus on is do not hold yourself back and think, well, I shouldn't talk to so-and-so. So Mitt Romney was here uh, in, at the bigger forum or, or whatnot. I had an opportunity to speak directly with Mitt on some ideas. So it doesn't matter who you think you can't talk to. Wipe that away. You can talk to the very top in business. Don't hold yourself back. All right? Now, item or lesson, lesson number two here for my USD TV experience is ultimately you have to do the right thing by the business. So we had worked extremely hard to build the technology, to build the marketing and the business plan. And we had a group of broadcasters come to us and say, hey, before you go too big, we want to buy you. So I was the number one shareholder with the group. And then I had friends and partners and associates that were with me. They made an offer. I went to my friends and partners and they said, Steve, we think we can do much bigger. And so ultimately, we turned it down. Okay? My advice to you is, you're building a business, you're in a sweet spot, and somebody that's already in the ecosystem that you're participating in, if they present you with an offer, what should you do? Take the money. Okay? Why is that? Because there, what, we, what we read about in the, in, the new, in, the, uh, uh, in the media and what we hear about is we hear about these grand slams. We hear about somebody having an idea and getting paid a billion dollars for it. Okay, it happens. But what is the norm? The norm is just like life what happens is you get to grow a step at a time. You get to go from learning uh, you know, lower levels of math to you know, the highest levels of calculus or whatever. It takes time to get there. So my advice to you guys would be study it out, do the right thing. But as you make progress, don't be afraid to say, okay, well, this was a good stage here. I'm going to go ahead and exit or join somebody or take the money or make a move that sort of feels like in a way that you've sold yourself out but the reality is is it's put you in a better position because you'll learn and you'll grow from that experience you'll have a little more money in your pocket you'll have a better understanding of, of basic principles and then you'll do it again if that's the entrepreneurial stage that you want to, if, you're, if, you're, if, if you don't go to work for a larger company, you can always do it again. And guess what? You'll do it from a great sense of credibility because you've actually taking, you've taken a product to market or you've taken something to the finish line. So don't be afraid to, to view your career in stages. It's tempting to say, well, I want to go big. Well, yeah, you, you will go big. But usually it goes over time. Does that make sense? So that, that's something that I, that I learned from, from the USD TV side. So let's talk about disruption a little more specifically. So the group that we were going after with USD TV was Comcast. Why doesn't Comcast, when the, when the, uh, when the newcomers come along, why doesn't Comcast immediately jump and offer a skinny bundle? So let's say they came, they, their average price is 80 bucks. Somebody comes out with a competitive price. So they say, all right, we will skinny it down and we'll give it to you for 20 bucks. Why don't they do that? They can't afford to. The bottom line is their expense profile 
is so huge, as big as they are, their expenses are just as big. So the challenge that the large organizations that struggle to really compete is for them to come down. So what does that allow? It allows the newcomers to come in and get a foothold. The largest miss in U.S. cable history is what? Unbelievable, right? Why in the world, when Netflix left, you guys remember Netflix used to be just a, a, a product delivered via the mail. They weren't digital in the early days. The disc that, you know, you went to your mailbox and picked it up. Once they go digital, when the technology allows them to do it, why doesn't an arrogant Comcast look at those guys and say, you know what, they could be a problem, we should take them out now. Why don't they do it? Because they can't. They can't provide a service that dramatically lowers their revenue profile while maintaining their huge expense profile. They're stuck. They can't move. The, uh, uh, the, the innovators, uh, the innovators dile uh, dilemma and solution from Clayton Christensen, if you haven't read those books or heard about them, you need to pour over those books. Clayton Christensen. He's, uh, he was the dean of the Harvard Business School. He's one of the best of the best, okay? So that's a really good book for you to pour over. The bottom line is the cost infrastructure of the big uh, incumbents doesn't allow them to get in the space. Sears is probably the biggest example of the worst performing company in, the, in U.S. history. Okay? Sears used to be the Amazon of the world. Sears was everything. People waited for their Sears, the Sears catalog to show up. They wanted to buy from Sears. Sears had tens of billions of revenue, right? Well, who came along in the early, day, in the early days to take a piece of their space? Why didn't they respond? Because they couldn't do it. Their cost equation had become so big, their expenses so big, they couldn't uh, compete. Now, the reality is, is that some people are trying to figure it out. So here's a really interesting study right now. How many in here, if you think about travel, how many of you think about, well, I would rather do Airbnb, or you think about Airbnb before you think of Marriott? Yeah. Raise your hand. Okay, so this should frighten the heck out of Marriott, right? Because what they were thinking all along was that Sheraton and Weston and the other chains that they're now scooping up, by the way, as quickly as they can, would be the problem. No, what's the real competitor? The vacant room sitting in somebody's second home in Cabo. That is their real competitor. So really understanding, the beautiful thing is, you guys can come in with a fresh perspective because you're living it. So the, again, you may be working for Marriott soon, okay? You may be working for one of these big incumbents and you have to force them to think fresh about who their competition is. This next one for me is one of the, is one of the most amazing stories ever. And I, well, I had this GM slide long before the announcement, but I think yesterday GM announced was at 14,000. Uh, employees that they're they're letting go General Motors so what is the number one technological advance that's hitting the automotive industry today what is that what is it it is electric and it is autonomous driving the idea that the car will drive itself right those two are the biggest trends that are out there, and some would argue that the autonomous driving now is bigger than electric because of some of the challenges, but nevertheless, we'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. But here's the interesting stat. Five years ago, four to five years ago, if you told GM or anybody in Detroit that somebody completely outside of the autonomous thinking would lead it, they would not have believed you. But who is number one in autonomous driving? Uber. They've got more money into it and more technology right now than anybody. Google probably, you would put 
next in that vein. And then Toyota, <laughs> right? It's crazy. But these guys aren't even in the game. Tesla obviously is in the electric game. But these guys are not even in the game, and now they're leading the most important part of their business. So why do I bring it up? It's both sides. Get really excited about the opportunities that you have with respect to breaking in as an entrant into the game as a, as a smaller entrant, because you can go in and you can compete faster than you think. If you go to work for General Motors, it may be a great job. It may be the exact right thing to do. You better be talking to their guys all day long about, hey, that, that guy over there could be a problem. We better be paying attention. Instead of letting Netflix come in and all of a sudden take over the whole thing. Now the crazy thing is, Comcast and the big cable companies, they write their user interface protocols to what Netflix wants them to write them to. It's crazy, right? Disruption is an amazing thing that's happening. So I want to now pivot and talk about controlled environment agriculture. I came to this space because like the, the um, USD TV and the Netflix that got me excited about the technology innovation with media, the robotics technology, the lighting technology, and I'll review this in more detail, but robotics, AI, LED lighting, water savings, land reduction is coming to agriculture in amazing ways. How many of you here have heard of vertical farming or have watched what's going on with indoor, indoor growing? So when someone says indoor growing, what's the first thing that comes to mind? 365. Cannabis, weed, right? I mean, it's taking over the world right now. That's not our topic today. Um, but uh, it's, it's obviously an amazing story. But I want to tell you real quick about my, my parent company, NewSkin. NewSkin is one of those companies out of Provo, Utah right now. They're in 50 countries, founded in 1984. Current valuation today is not 4.8, but it's probably in the low fours. They donated 600 million meals to kids in Africa, if you can believe it. 600 million they've delivered. New Skin has said, we've got to change our entire thinking if we want to compete for the next generation. What they're doing right now is they have 1.2 million distributors and users of their product every month. They've recently purchased manufacturing capabilities, and now with Grovive, they own growing technology that allows them to grow safe and secure, sustainable, and self-reliant. How many in here have heard about the lettuce recall or romaine lettuce or whatever it is? There are so many challenges with agriculture. If you can bring it indoors and you can control it every single time, you wipe away the vagaries of weather, of pesticides, and whatever. John Black probably went into it a little bit with you. The New Skin said, we want to be in the controlled, safe, self-reliant business. So now they're completely vertically integrated. They grow their own ingredients for their products. Their manufacturers make those products and, and contain them, if you will, package them, and then their distributors sell it. It's an amazing success story. So in the time that I've got left, in the next 10 minutes, and then we'll throw it out to some Q&A here. Wait, is it 1220? Right. As long as we've got to go. So let me run, hopefully this video will work. It'll just give you a quick overview of what's going on with Grow Beef. Sounds coming. It'll come. We could give a seed the perfect day, every day. At Grow Beef, we asked ourselves that question. Our scientists, nutritionists, and engineers researched every stage in the growing process for dozens of different seeds. The seeds needed to grow everything from nutraceutical ingredients to animal feed. What is the perfect amount of water, light, and nutrients to help plants naturally grow to their full nutritious potential? 
Is it possible to grow in any climate around the world? The search for these answers led us to the development of the Grove Eve Grow Pod. The Grow Pod is an autonomous growing system measuring only 15,000 cubic feet and yielding over 100 acres of fresh greens on less than 3% of the water normally used. Through constant analysis, our team is able to dial in the optimal conditions needed to grow the purest, cleanest, locally produced plant nutrients possible. In just one climate controlled building containing 10 grow pods, we can grow over 1,000 acres of high density nutrients year round. The GrowBeef system operates an advanced predictive management software called Sawyer. Using artificial intelligence, we create an analysis loop between the grow pod and our innovation center labs to perfect each growing cycle. Our AI software can be integrated into other digital systems running the farm to help owners predictably manage energy use, animal yields and health, as well as other processes vital to increasing revenues. Grove is the world's leader in sustainable agriculture technology. For us, it starts with the seed and rapidly expands into the next generation of farming. We see a bright future for agriculture, one that's sustainable, both financially and environmentally. And most importantly, one that cultivates trust and value between the farmer and the global populations they feed every day. At Grove Eve, our mission is to responsibly nourish the world. <coughs> okay, so just a little bit about the system real quick. The name of the game, as it is with driving capabilities, is automation. The challenge that you have on the farm is largely labor. It's a big issue. So if you can figure out a way to uh, build an automatic or autonomized system, then this is what we've built here that represents 100 acres uh, just in about 1,000 square feet. So think about the game-changing capability that is. So what are the challenges in agriculture today? Well, they are labor, as I've talked about. They are energy optimization. Transportation, when you sit down and have a salad, how far has the salad had to travel to reach to your table? Sometimes thousands of miles. Think about the amount of diesel fuel it took to deliver your salad. Water is probably the number one issue facing our planet today. Land, they're not making any more land. Okay, the land we've got is the land we've got, and it's a challenge, especially in China. And I met with a leading businessman this morning from Algeria, he's the Jeff Bezos of Algeria, guy's a multi-billionaire, and he is really interested because they only have so much land and then you run into desert in Algeria as far as the eye can see. And then a big issue obviously is the pesticides and the herbicides. One of the things that I find really interesting, and I'll ask you just again by a raise of hand, how many of you essentially look for transparency when you buy your food? Is it, is it of interest to you to know where your food came from? Raise your hand if it's something that you're increasingly interested in. You may not be actually doing it, but it's something that you want to pay attention to. So with technology now, you can go back to, through blockchain or other transparent uh, technologies, you can go back and take a look at where your salad came from. You could, you could go back with your milk, you go to the farm, you want to see how the, what the conditions are on the farm. Is the farmer taking good care of the animals? It's a major, major deal, the transparency side of the business. So starting with water, our system does a precise drip technology. It's not hydroponics where you soak essentially the plant and then you recircle the water. We, we do a, a specific drip technology that when we harvest, all the water has been absorbed into the plant and there's no water left. So we're trying to optimize. We think we can get to 1% of the water used. It's usually nine, 90 million gallons 
90 million gallons of water for a 100 acre farm on wheat or barley, we think we can get it down to about 900,000. So a massive game changer from a sustainability standpoint. That building right there is basically a tennis court and then, and then a tennis court and a half basically long and a tennis court wide. And that represents at the Bateman Farm just across Utah Lake uh, on the west side there, that represents with 10 grow pods in there, a thousand acres in basically a tennis court size facility. So again, what's happening? Lighting technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, everything you're studying in other verticals, major sectors are now attacking a very, very um, uh, vulnerable, I would say, and inefficient agriculture market right now. If you can grow the plant and you can assure the person that's buying it that there are no pesticides attached with the plant, we think that is a massive story. Year round is a huge deal. Think about farmers, what do they do? They cut all summer long, they cut like crazy, they let it dry, they bail it up, they ship it to where they've got it go, and then they cover it up, and then they usually, you know, they feed it because how many people, how many farmers are growing in mid-February in North America? You're not, right? You don't have a year-round growing. So again, it's highly inefficient. If you can move a lot of that growing indoors, you grow year round and you provide f fresh feed for animals as well year round. The, the lighting systems that we've developed are, are massively efficient when it comes to energy and energy savings. And these are the markets that we're going after. Right now we're growing wheatgrass, barley, grains, nutraceuticals, animal feed, uh, some of the best and the highest use of of uh, crops. At Grovive, it's really a science and technology play. So we're not looking to be the uh, um, we're not looking to be the grower. We're not looking to be the farmer. What we're looking to do is provide the science and the technology that makes them better. So the campaign that Intel uses a lot with their machines is the Intel inside is what's really driving the machine. Well, we want to be the Intel inside for indoor growing and, and, and farmers, if you will. But here's the key. It takes you to grow wheat barley one week, and it's that thick and that deep. You get it to our labs, to the, to the New Skin Science Labs, they can look at it for all of the various items, including protein and the omegas and things that you look for in it. You self-optimize, you can send it back in another week, you can be testing it again. How do farmers test now? Cut, end of the year, say how did I do? How did my water do? What was my weather like? What fertilizer did I put on? Okay, next spring, six months later when I plant or seven months later, whatever it is, where, wherever you are, then they try to figure it out. Now, we can have tests every week telling them, here's how you'll optimize it. The name of the game? is to get to self-learning and to get to machine learning so the humans walk away. The pod grows, it gets to the science lab technology, they look at what the key metrics are, you learn from it, and then you grow it again. So that is a key deal. One of the major issues across the world right now is the safety and the security of the meat that you eat. And what uh, what is fed to those animals. And so something that we're working hard on is to get a brand certification against meat product that says that animal was fed a pure, safe, and sustain a sustainable uh, ration and feed. Grass-fed, how many of you, when you go into a restaurant, you look on the menu and it says grass-fed beef, right? How much do you pay for that? Extra. Double. Right? You pay a lot. So our, our goal would be to say, okay, if you like grass-fed, wait till you try grow beef, fed beef. It's pure and sustainable. It's going to be a better product. Again, the traceability 
is continuing. That is a hot market. If you want to develop some technology that allows people to understand exactly where that glass of milk came from, you go to Walmart. Walmart spent a lot of money on their groceries so that you can take it, you can scan it. Uh, it will tell you what farm that thing was produced on. It's a big deal. Safety, sustainability, and self-reliant. So the, 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 I'll end with this. The, the, uh, the breakfast that I had this morning with the Jeff Bezos of Algeria basically goes like this. Steve, we are an OPEC country. We make uh, hundreds of billions of dollars a year from fossil fuels, but the fossil fuel graph looks like that. So what are we going to do? Right now we can afford to buy everything. We don't have any dairies in our country. We have like a few, you know, 100 cow dairies, you know, whatever. They import 2.5 billion pounds of powdered milk a year from other countries. Are they self-reliant? Not even close. Many countries around the world import 90% or more of all of their agriculture from other countries. So if you're trying to feed countries, what is it you're trying to do? You gotta, you gotta improve your agriculture capabilities on the ground. So we think it's a, it's a big opportunity there. Let, before we go to Q&A, and we only have five minutes, but I'll, I'll be around. We, we can talk and then do, however you want to do it. So if you want to reach out to me, my email is srlindsley, L-I-N-D-S-L-E-Y, at groveeve.com. srlindsley, L-I-N-D-S-L-E-Y, at groveeve.com. So I'll be happy to answer questions via email if you want to shoot me a thought or if you have some ideas or want to come see us or whatnot, we'd be happy to to spend some time with you. So in the four minutes that I have, what questions can I answer? Back in the back. Do you think you make progress on like corn or potatoes or other, if you like, has the company looked into growing more vegetable types? Yeah. So, so right now our focus has been we're growing off of a tray that requires no soil. So the robot plants the seed onto the tray and then the robot at the right time hits it with the right water. So we're growing out of a tray. So the stuff that makes the most sense for us right now is wheat, barley, alfalfa, spinach, stuff that grows like this. The, uh, one of the biggest producers of tomatoes, I want to say, in North America is the uh, indoor growing facility just up the street in Mona, Utah. They have a big, huge hothouse greenhouse there, and they're growing tomatoes there. There's another big indoor growing company called Plenty. Anybody heard of Plenty? So Plenty, what they've decided to do is they have a wall technology and a drip technology, which is actually pretty efficient. So that allows them, you could grow strawberries and and whatever. We are looking at a technology I just got back from uh, Vancouver last or before Thanksgiving and we are looking at a technology that will allow us to expand quickly into more mixed greens and sprouts and those kinds of things. So we're interested in it. Right now we're trying to stay focused. Other question right here. So I'm from a farming community and I have done a lot of work with farmers on work on like innovation products and uh, projects and stuff. And I've noticed there tends to be a lot of pushback. These traditional um, kind of older generations, they are a little bit worried about what it takes to progress. Um, so what has been your experience with trying to convert farmers? Great to question. It's, it's probably the number one issue. And what it speaks to, so what she's saying is she grew up in a farming community and, and spent time, whatever, and farmers are really entrenched. In, in their ways of, of doing business. Are they different than the automobile industry or the, uh, the hotel industry or the cable industry or whatever, guys, that, guys and gals that have grown up in that space? Yes, they are in that they, what I've noticed with farmers is it's in their heart. They really, you know, they want to pass it down to their kids. Well, we've got the people that I've talked to, they care about the generations. But in all other sense, they're exactly the same. What they know is what they're comfortable with and is what they do, and it works. And they're scared to death to jump out into some of this new stuff. And all the while, guess who comes up from behind? 
So my comment to the farmers is, you're just like General Motors or Ford. Don't kid yourself. There will be others that's too big. Milk and dairy products is too big of a, of a, a, a vertical, tens of billions of dollars. Other people will do it more efficiently and they'll make money through technology. So you have a choice to make. Do you want to ride it out to the sunset? Or do you want to jump on the bandwagon and figure out a way to take your infrastructure and make it better? And that's what we're trying to do right now. It's a five alarm fire. When I meet with the top guys, I'm saying, let me walk you through the disruption discussion. And I'm saying to the dairy industry right now anyway, you're no different than any other industry. If you don't jump on indoor lighting, if you don't jump on autonomous and robotic milking is a hot, hot product, and the farmers are really nervous about it. They think, ah, it's not as efficient or whatnot. It's amazingly efficient. I don't know if you guys know this, but in robotic dairies, the cows milk themselves. You don't need someone with a little stick to shoo them along to get them into a milk parlor or whatnot. They just get in line because it's time to milk. And they get in, the door shuts behind them, and the robot, you know, is it perfect? No, but it's coming. So they got to get on board. You know, one last question, because it's, it's 20 after. So how do you, uh, with, with all this technology and stuff, like obviously you can grow a lot more per acre or whatever, you know, but your costs per acre or per pound are going to be so much higher, and that's going to, you know, pass down to the, yeah. to the consumer. So yeah. what are your, kind of your projections there? Like, Good what question. Esplan Livestock, a guy that's asking with a little bit of uh, energy. Let you and I spend some time after, but here's how I'll answer it, because I can get really down to the nitty gritty on the numbers for you. But when you first bought your first HDTV, how much did it cost you? Two or three grand? And if you, you know, you go to Walmart, how much does it cost you now? I mean, you can buy a cheap one for $4.99 or $3.99 or whatever. Robotics, artificial intelligence, LED lighting. Right now, the cost equation I, is, is more expensive than the low-end alfalfa. I'll grant you that. But the costs are coming down quickly, right? And it's not just about cost. It's what's the benefit to the animal. If you can feed the animal fresh, no pesticides, do it with less water, fully sustainable, you're going to jump on that bandwagon because you have to tell that sustainable story online and everywhere you re reach out to your constituency. Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate being here. I'd just like to present uh, Steve Lindsley with the Thunderbird Award in oh, recognition thank you. That's uh, of, very his, cool. of his time and also his very, his, his very generous donation to uh, our, our business idea yeah. competition. So once more. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.